Good morning, everybody. I can't see you, but I assume there are people out there. The light is shining in my eyes. Thank you, Ashkan. Um, <clears throat> previous flotation conferences had also invited me to give a talk, and what I used to talk about is the history of REST, primarily research, but also applications. And last year, I talked about how interest in this approach grew, diminished, grew, diminished, and now is growing again, starting in the 1950s with the invention of the what was then called the perceptual isolation chamber by Donald Hebb, a professor uh, in Montreal. There was a burst of interest in the 1950s and 1960s, and then it started to drop off. But in the 1970s, when John Lilly came in with the flotation tank, it exploded again and was very hot uh, in the 1970s and part of the 80s, and then for various reasons, uh, interest diminished. Just at the time that it started to, to uh, disappear again, there were scientific reviewers of the literature on rest who said that the results were quite interesting, but they were not very solid. So that there were you know, one or two studies on this and one or two studies on that, but you didn't really have enough information to be sure about what the conclusions ought to be. And I've been thinking about that, and one of the things that I've thought about is what areas are there in which that's not the case, in which there is enough research that we can draw pretty reliable conclusions. And that reminded me of a talk by Donald Rumsfeld, whom you may remember, uh, Secretary of Defense under President Bush. And he said what I've quoted up there about things we know we know, things we know we don't know, and things we don't know we don't know. <laughs> he was greeted with laughter. Uh, people thought that was a pretty silly comment. And I thought about it, and I have concluded that he was right. There are things that we're sure we know, some of which may actually be true, some of which may not. There are things that we're aware that we don't know. There are some effects of flotation rest, for example, and effects of all kinds of other procedures where we're not, we don't really know what, what the outcome is. And then there are things out there that we've never thought of. And those things are the things we don't know we don't know. So applied to flotation rest, to the research literature, um, I came up with the following criteria for assigning particular bits of knowledge to one or the other of those categories. So what we know are the, are the effects that have been researched by a number of studies, that have controls, that have a large enough sample to draw conclusions from, and that have quantitative data not just impressions or anecdotes. You have to remember there's an old saying that the plural of anecdote is not data. It's just more anecdotes. <laughs> then there are things that we may know, that we think we know, but we're not really sure. So there have been a few studies perhaps, there are some data, but not enough studies, not enough data, not enough good controls, not enough measures, and so on, to be firm in claiming Yes, we know that. Then there are things we don't know. And here's where the anecdotes and self-reports come in and observations by researchers or by people who operate float tanks. That is, we have reports from people that this happens, but we don't really have data about it. Okay? And I think we can split the results of the flotation literature into two very large categories. One is things that we know we know and we may know, but there's this whole other thing that we are somehow aware of, but we're not really sure of how to measure it, uh, how to evaluate it. And, and a lot of that is the kind of deep self, self-insight, semi-mystical experiences, out-of-body uh, contact with extraterrestrials, 
and all kinds of other things like that. Now, we know there are lots of people who report a variety of such altered states effects, but the data on that are, are missing. So those are things that we have an inkling about, but we don't really know it. And then there is that vast, possibly vast, amount of stuff that we don't know we don't know. If you don't know that you don't know, you can't even ask questions because you don't know what to ask them about, right? So <coughs> for the purposes of this talk, I thought I would take a look at the phenomena that belong to these four different categories as regards flotation rest. Now I should tell you this is not a systematic, exhaustive literature search. I didn't do that or review, um, but I indicated where m such a review might be useful and where we might need more research before we even do the review. And I think in, in the ones that I categorize as what we know we know, uh, somebody ought to do some meta-analyses, which is a, a mathematical, statistical technique for combining the results of lots of different studies and determining just how reliable those results are across studies to see whether, to what extent this, the results are consistent uh, across particular studies. Nobody's ever done that with flotation rest, and I think now there are probably enough studies to be worth trying to do that. A reason why this is a good time to do that is that there is this sudden growth, maybe gradual but fast, growth of interest in flotation. And somebody said this morning that unlike before when they mention flotation or flotation rest to a random person, more and more people say, oh yes, I've heard about that. And I said, and more and more when I, say, I mention that to somebody, they are likely to say, oh yeah, I floated. So there is a growth of interest out there, not only among the people who are professionally involved, but among the general public. So it's a good time to do the review from that point of view. It may also spark a renewed interest among researchers. There are a, a bunch of new researchers in the field Nowhere near as many as there were originally, but it seems to be coming back in that regard as well. And in the categories that I'm going to show you, there are um, uh, two subcategories. One is research from previous years, and one is more recent research. But the other thing is that I've also done a kind of random surfing of the web for claims that are being made for flotation. And some of these are made by tank operators. Some of them are made by people who have floated. Many of them are made by uh, media people, magazine writers, uh, radio uh, commentators, and so on, who well, read the, some of the literature and maybe have floated once, and then they're experts, and um, they tell us what it's all about. Now, <clears throat> I've mentioned previously that um, Neil Miller, who is one of the, the towering figures in behavioral health um, and medical psychology, once said that, what, that we should be bold in what we try, but cautious in what we claim. And I think we are bold in what we try. I'm not so sure that all of us are cautious in what we claim. So this is kind of a warning. The warning is that People who are enamored with floating, or people who do it for a living, or people who just find it very interesting, should be very cautious in what they say it, it can do. Partly because you might mislead people who don't experience the things that you tell them they should. Partly because we don't really know the boundaries of what flotation can accomplish and what it can't on a regular basis, on a consistent basis, and partly because in some of the claims that I've seen, there are assertions that are not really well-founded, but that are verging on medical advice. 
And if you give medical advice without a stable, solid research foundation, you're opening yourself up to legal problems. Okay? Um, false advertising is, is usually or frequently overlooked, but when it comes to medical treatments, um, all you have to do is find one or two people who say, well, we were led to believe that such and such is going to happen uh, that will improve our health, and it didn't and you're in big trouble. So that's, uh, one, of, that's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to do this review, so as to give the community some idea of what it is safe to claim and what is perhaps less safe or more risky. So here's what we know about therapeutic applications of flotation. Okay, I'm not going to read the slide to you. You can read faster than I can talk. Anyway, but you can see the major categories, reduced pain, and reduced pain from a variety of sources, um, improved muscle tone and, and muscle control, and reduced stress and tension. And all of these, as you can see from, this is just a random sampling of the literature, it's not an exhaustive review, all of these have considerable backing from actual studies, fair number of studies, and there's there are many more than these, both in the early days or early years of flotation research and more recently. Okay? So I think we're, we're fairly sure that we can claim these as consistent effects, not universal, not everybody gets these benefits, but most people do. Here's what we know about the effects of flotation on behavioral health. There are fewer studies on this, but still enough uh, to draw pretty good conclusions. People who are burnt out, stressed out at work, after flotation, there have been some studies showing that they can get back to work and they feel better about it and so on. Stress management and relaxation, not just floating when you have a particular stressful experience or stress reaction, but more generally, uh, over a long period of time. Reduced blood pressure, and the, pre the reduced blood pressure is both among normal tenses, people who have normal blood pressure, um, and people who are, are hypertensive. <clears throat> and there are studies showing that rest is a, an active treatment methodology, not just a placebo that has an effect because people expect it to have an effect. So that's good, that we know also. We also know that rest has positive effects on various kinds of performance. Some of it cognitive, creativity, memory, recall, recognition. Um, <clears throat> improved athletic performance on a number of different sports. And again, this has both a lot of old research and some new research very consistent, and enhanced learning and um, recall of what you've just learned. So again, this I think you can claim safely as being reliable effects of flotation. Now here's what we may know. That is, we have some data, but perhaps not enough to be very firm about claiming these outcomes. Okay. Fibromyalgia study is going on now. Presumably in the near future we will have enough to move it from this category into the what we know category. I pay personality, pilot studies, but not really enough data to draw firm conclusions. One thing that we really need to do research on is what it is that flotation rest is good for and what it is that chamber rest is good for. I was very pleased to see that there will be a talk about chamber rest tomorrow in the conference. I think we have neglected that, ignored it, and I think that's a mistake because it is very useful uh, in some applications. And then the whole issue of altered states, self-hypnosis, um, deepened meditation. I have a very good anecdote about meditation also, but it's not a datum. So that's what we may know. Here's what else we may know. 
pleasant memories. People report more pleasant memories in the tank than they do when they're just reminiscing uh, in normal environments. They are happier. And if they're uncomfortable physically, they may benefit from floating. And there have been a few studies about, of, uh, of pregnant women who report after floating that the discomforts of pregnancy have been eased by being there. But these are, these are anecdotal reports. Nobody's ever really tried to systematically look into these uh, claims. Now, here's what we don't know. Okay. We don't know why it works. Now, some of the physical effects may be because of the Epsom salts. That's kind of disappointing because then why bother with all the other stuff, the darkness and the silence and so forth? Why just let people soak in Epsom salts? So we're, most of us are hoping that there's more to it than that. But just exactly what there is to it um, is a matter that theorists have been arguing about or discussing for decades, and uh, there are many multiple competing theories. Mine is the best, but others are pretty good too. <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that. Ashkan said we're not competitive, we're friendly and peaceful. So they're all good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We don't know, as I said, what, is, what are the best things for treatment by flotation and treatment by chamber rest. And that would be good to, to um, find out, partly because it might encourage float tank operators to also think about adding a rest chamber to their facility. If we find out that you can put people in rest chambers and treat things that flotation doesn't work on, that could add a significant new tool uh, to your treatment procedures. And then there are questions about how long should one float to get the best results? How many times should you float to get the best results? How many times in a particular week or month or whatever you should, do, you should float to get the best results? We don't know that. There have been a few explorations of it, but Nothing really uh, very convincing. Now, what we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, I want to thank everybody who was involved in my research. As it says, I've been doing rest research for about 35 years. Actually, it's closer to 40, but um, it's been fun. And a lot of people uh, participated in it in one way or another, uh, helped me, helped themselves, and so forth. And I am grateful to all of them. If you want any further information, uh, like specific references of all those references that I put on the screen, um, get in touch with me. Thank you.